a question on uh, translating the chant. Um, uh, yeah, so the chant, this particular chant, Namo Kwan Shuryen Pusa, the Namo is, um, is from, it's kind of descended from the Sanskrit uh, greeting, which uh, it's the same word as Namaste or Namaskar, which is, a, which is just a, the greeting of, of honoring. But it, it can translate as I honor or I bow to. Uh, there's a beautiful, uh, there's a beautiful evocative translation that uh, my teachers use. Uh, I return my life as a way of translating the gesture of honoring. I honor. So namo is I honor, I give back, I bow to, I venerate. Uh, and then her name, Quan Shi Yin. This is a Chinese transliteration, sort of. It's like a mystical transliteration of the name Avalokiteshvara, um, the one who listens to the cries of the world while resting at ease. And, and that's a long kind of esoteric translation. So, um, uh, but, uh, but it speaks to, uh, my understanding of it is that, is that the literal aspects in it are of speaking to the listening quality and, um, and to the, the resting at ease quality. So the one who listens at ease. And then Pusa is, um, is again, a Chinese transliteration of the Sanskrit word Bodhisattva um, or Bosa, you, you'll see in Japanese as well. Um, and so uh, it's, it's, I honor the Bodhisattva Kuan Yin, or I honor the, the Bodhisattva who listens at ease to the cries of the world. And the word bodhisattva, many of you will be familiar with, some may not. Bodhi means awake, and sattva means being. So being devoted to wakefulness. Um, in some traditions, bodhisattvas are beings who are on the long path toward becoming a fully awakened Buddha. In other traditions, bodhisattvas are essentially fully enlightened Buddhas themselves, but who make uh, who make the choice to manifest in various forms in order to serve suffering beings. And so that's the way the Chinese um, and the Tibetans, the Himalayan traditions, hold Avalokiteshvara and Kuan Yin, that they are actually um, a Buddha, a fully awakened being, uh, but they choose to be in this form of a Bodhisattva um, as a part of a vow to liberate all beings. Uh, to remain in the world to liberate all beings. So, uh, uh, yeah. So, so that's a bit about the the mantra. There. Um, there's a question, and uh, can I speak about my teachers? Yeah. Uh, many many teachers have been really important to me, but the ones I'm speaking about right now, uh, from whom I'm in the the lineage stream of this particular practice, the Kuan Yin Dharmas, is uh, a, a beautiful couple, um, Kitisaro and Tanisara. Uh, they were both um, monastics um, in the lineage of Ajahn Shah, uh, primarily in England, for uh, quite a long time, Kitisaro for 15 years, Tanisara for 12, at the very beginning of the founding of the Ajahn Shah monastic lineage in England. And uh, and they were they were you know very dedicated practitioners a very dedicated monk and nun, and um, they fell in love while they were monastics without ever being in a room alone together without ever touching, um, and uh, Tanisra says they jumped the wall, together, so they left the monastery it was a bit dramatic, but with a lot of blessing from their friends and they went they married, and then they've taught together for the last you know. 30 years. Uh, initially, they spent many years, uh, over a decade in South Africa. They were invited to teach there and they founded a hermitage and a center there that they've, that they've now passed on to indigenous wisdom holders in South Africa and the community there. They did really beautiful community service and AIDS work there in the 90s. And um, uh, so uh, you can find that center at Dharmagiri is its name. And, um, and they now live here in California, 
and, um, and they run uh, Sacred Mountain Sangha. So you can find them online. And I uh, train with them and practice with them and they're dear friends. And uh, so, uh, yeah, Ketisaro and Tanisara. And Tanisara is, um, is, is really stepping out right now uh, very strongly as an activist. Uh, and so you'll see her voice in activist circles. And uh, yeah, um, uh, a question about um, meditations for uh, the full body. Um, I do have some meditations on Insight Timer. Um, I have lots of them on my own website. Um, and you can, my website is linked on the, the page for this talk, Rick's page. So you can go to my audio there and um, and you'll find uh, talks and meditations. And there's, uh, there's several entire sets that are um, somatically oriented, full body oriented, and, so, uh, and several sets oriented uh, particularly for uh, trauma. So um, you can find those there. If you don't find exactly what you need um, there, feel free to send me a note through the contact form on my site. And I, I'll see if I can dig up what would be helpful to you there. Um, and then one question here, um, good question. Um, it's easy enough to summon compassion for those who've been starved and crushed into the rubble, victims of violence anywhere, and have had their livelihoods and futures robbed. How do I find compassion for those who perhaps need it more, those who are so separate from our common humanity that they could perpetrate such horrors without question? I think you said your own answer, you know. what? A profound suffering it must be to be separated from one's own humanity, uh, to uh, to be able to to give rise to such violence. You know what horrible trauma and oppression must be at play for those who cause and initiate and to carry out such violence. Uh, many of those committing such violence were experienced violence themselves. And this is true on the individual level, on the family level. It runs through families. And of course, it runs through cultures and ancestries. Um, the long trauma of the colonial period hangs over all of us. And the long uh, continuing traumas of, uh, you know, all of the harm done in the world. Uh, and so, uh, you know, and and yeah, there's a serious question spoken maybe in a in a in a perhaps slightly bitter way. You know, uh, all of the evil people were harmed. You know, and our our beleaguered ex president uh, Trump here was mentioned, um, but there are many like him who were harmed and who cause harm um, on all sides of, of political spectrums spectra. And where it leaves us is is that the Dharma is actually um, a very radical intervention in the world. It's not, it's not a simple, uh, you know, it's not a panacea. It's not about individual healing only. Um, and, and it's not about uh, justice, actually. Um, that's a different discourse that is important. The Dharma does something I think really profound and difficult, which is that it, it goes beyond the short-term harms that we can see. And by short-term, maybe I mean this century, and maybe I mean this millennium, and maybe I mean as far back as recorded history. You know, um, you know Mr. Trump's crimes are, are legendary at this point. Um, and and, and you may feel any number of ways about him, uh, but he's in some trouble right now, so that perhaps we can agree on. Um, and, you know, uh, his, um, you know, we, we, we also know enough about his family to know that his father was pretty abusive and that they were an immigrant family who came over um, in some uh, difficult circumstances. And we know that the immigrant experience is not without profound suffering. And that just goes back and it goes back and it goes back. And that doesn't excuse anyone for their actions. 
um, but it makes it possible to give compassion because compassion is not time-bound either. It understands that those who create a devastating empire uh, did so out of fear and anguish and were themselves harmed. And that doesn't excuse their actions, but it, it allows us a different way in. And that different way in is the radical intervention of compassion without uh, limitation. And it's not easy. It's not easy. And there's, other, and there's other things that are important. Justice is important. Intervention is important. Boundaries are important. Um, you know? Yeah. The, the instruction is to feel compassion for those who are evil. Um, and, and that, you know, the justice piece is, is complex. We'd have to figure out what justice means. In a way, karma is a long-term uh, understanding of profound justice. And it says that those who, who cause harm will reap the fruit of that harm. They will suffer as a result of causing that harm, whether in this life or another. Um, and that's difficult to square with our, with, with ideas of justice that are, that are, that are, have a shorter boundary to them, you know, that something should happen in this lifetime, you know, or that a wrong should be fixed somehow in this lifetime. You know, the Buddha understood that the, the, the seeds of, of all the traumas are greed, hatred, and delusion, and that they are without beginning. That there is no beginning to those poisons in the world. And so then we can't think that we're going to solve them by, you know, imprisoning or punishing somehow some particular wrongdoer, even though it is completely appropriate to do what's necessary to try to stop harm from, being ha from happening further. And that's a complicated dance. So I'll put that one down there. That wasn't the intended topic for the, for the night, but it's completely appropriate as we touch into compassion in a moment like this when there is such intense harm happening in the world. Of course, there always was, you know. The Buddha was teaching uh, 500 years before the birth of Christ, you know, more or less uh, contemporary with you know, the great wars against the Persians and the Greeks and between, and in Sparta and the, you know, there was, there was, there was war in China, you know, nearby, like there's been, there's been horrific devastation everywhere for a long time. Um, and if we believe the mythology, then we might understand that his vision into suffering gave him an understanding that these wars and this harm was happening everywhere. You know, the idea is that the Buddha could, had clairvoyance, that he could see what was happening in places. So we have to understand that at least he knew that there was so much war and devastation going on. And knowing that, this is what he taught, right? To steady the mind, to settle the heart, to radiate compassion to all beings without exception. And and he was uh, he was pretty measured in his crit in his criticism, you know, of evildoers. When, when, a traumatized king came to him, King Ajatasattu, who had killed his own father, um, to become king, and his father was a dear friend of the Buddha's. So this uh, this person comes to the Buddha, who has murdered the Buddha's friend and a dear supporter, his own father. And he's tormented by grief and doubt and fear. The Buddha gives him a beautiful talk, one of the most extensive, beautiful descriptions of the spiritual path in the entire canon. Uh, the fruits of the spiritual life, the fruits of the ascetic life, Diga Nikaya number two. Um, and uh, lays out the path in, in extraordinary detail, gives him a very generous talk. And then the king says, now I have to go. And the king says, and the, and the Buddha says, good king, do as you see fit. Right? He doesn't castigate him. He doesn't try to punish him. He doesn't withhold the Dharma. He gives it all. And then after the king leaves, the Buddha says to the monks, monks, 
the king is broken. The king is broken. Had his heart not been so wounded through the terrible actions he committed, his dharma eye would have opened right here tonight. But because of those actions, he was unable to hear to the depth that he might have otherwise. Protect your own heart through not causing harm. Right? That's the message. So, and the texts are profoundly compassionate. They tell us that in a, in a far future life, that this, uh, this king also comes to the Dharma and does awaken eventually. Uh, may we all, right? May we all. Even the ones you hate. All right, even the ones who don't, who don't seem to deserve it, right? Uh, everyone deserves to heal and awaken. All right, so welcome back from the break. That was a long, nice, chewy break. Um, and uh, so uh, what I was actually going to talk about tonight was concentration practice and the purifying of the mind. So I'm just going to go right there and we're going to, we'll, we'll weave it in a bit and we can return back to, um, you know, having compassion for evil people at the end and see how that weaves through. But you know, sit in a comfortable way, be at ease. Um, and I'll talk just a bit here and give some, give a little, give more, we'll give more space for questions. At the heart of the Buddha's meditation uh, instructions is the encouragement to set down the stories and images that make up the like the narrative channel in the mind. In other words, to stop thinking so much. When we do this, we come into contact with bodily energy. We come into contact with emotions and the somatic energies that underlie them. And many traditional uh, meditation uh, teachers and instructions, especially non-Western ones, um, seem to suggest that this quieting of the mind um, is not that difficult, or at least that it's only the first step. And I listened to some instructions uh, just earlier today by a, um, uh, by a Burmese teacher. And I, I see a conversation going on in the chat, continuing with the, the politics conversation that we were in. Um, that's okay, but I'll also encourage you to uh, if you like, set that down for the moment and, and be in the talk together. Uh, or if, if you're not one of the people in that conversation and you want to ignore it to just close your chat, um, it's a fine conversation um, and I respect it, uh, but I'm changing topics here. So setting that down for myself anyway at the moment, and we can come back to it at the end if, if need be. So, um, So the Buddha suggests this um, practice of setting down a story, essentially. So when we're, when we're stopping thinking, a lot of what we, uh, what we mean is that the, the mind, when uncontained by, in, by the intention towards stillness or directing, uh, produces a stream of story, right? We talk to ourselves, so the words pour forth. What's happening here seems to be that we have a quality, we have a cognitive power of um, directing our attention, right? Attention, like breathing, is both autonomic and volitional. So you can direct your attention on purpose towards something, right? You can on purpose look at something or try to think about something, chew on something intentionally. Um, you can on purpose ignore something, right? Or, or try to. But when we are not giving volitional uh, direction to our attention, it goes wherever it goes, right? As soon as you let the puppy off the leash, it runs to something. It's sniffing on something in the bushes. And the core principle that has been important for me in healing work, in somatic work, and in meditation is to remember that 
attention follows intensity. Attention is a factor of the autonomic nervous system, and it is part of the way our animal body tries to keep ourselves safe by mapping the environment around us. So various stimuli come in, sights and sounds and smells and tastes and sensations um, and ideas appear in the field. And the habitual thing our attention wants to do is turn towards the ones that might indicate danger because that might be unsafe for us, right? We're animals um, and we're not the top of the food chain. At least we, we weren't always. Maybe you feel like you are now. Um, then along comes a little pesky virus and you realize you're not. But mostly we are. But we weren't always, right? We are kind of slow running, soft, unarmored kind of animals. And we exhibit the nervous system of a prey animal. We startle easily. We look toward danger and we come up with defenses to fight or flee or somehow talk ourselves out of danger. That means that what the attention is doing when we are not directing it towards something is it's constantly scanning the environment for danger. Now a lot of us nowadays live in relatively safe physical environments and not everyone does and may they be safe uh, and you all, anyone here who's not in a safe physical environment, uh, may you get to one. But many of us, uh, more and more people in the world now, live in safer physical environments than before. And the threats have become relational, emotional. The threats are systemic um, and oppression. And, and worst of all, they're internalized. So, you know, there are threats that cause trauma and an and inability for the mind to settle because they are everywhere all the time. You know, if you are not in a privileged uh, position racially or, or economically, then racism and class oppression are a threat that never go away. And so then, how do I learn to relax? You know, when, when that that thing, you know, a hatred toward people who look like me or sound like me or make love like me is always there in the world. Attention wants to go to the intensity of the threat. You know, or I'm just, I'm just, you know, in my room on an ordinary day and um, I start to worry. What is worry? You know, what is worry and anxiety and fretting? and rumination. If we feel into the energies below these obsessive mental patterns, often there's an emotion like fear. And, and if we feel under that, there's going to be a kind of self-protection. You know, I'm afraid, you know, I'm afraid of my, uh, I'm afraid of not making it. You know, I'm not going to make it at work or I'm not going to be able to keep up with my responsibilities. I'm worried about this or that thing. Or I'm afraid to lose someone I love and I'm worried about them. And the obsessive thinking can be felt as a kind of nervous system response to a danger that we can't otherwise respond to. I can't fight back against the imminent loss of my father to cancer. I can't fight back against you know, the onslaught of emails. Um, I, and so where does that go, right? It goes into anxious thinking. It goes into rumination, right? And of course, rumination on the past, um, you know, I can't fix the past, but it feels like a threat. I did or said that thing, or I wish that had gone better, or I wish I had had more of that. Wishing and wanting is a way of trying to say there's a discomfort in my, at the core of my being, and I can't get to it but I'm going to try. And the trying comes out as this obsessive, you know, storytelling. How many times have I retold the story of that, that thing that happened when I was 22 and I could have been so heroic or sexy or smart or witty and I just wasn't. Ah, I just wasn't, you know? Um, and why can't the mind let that go? You know? 
you know, or that terrible thing that happened when I was young or at that whatever moment, whenever your trauma was, my trauma was, right? It comes back again and again and again, the somatic therapies tell us, because the charge that was there, the charge of self-protection never really resolved. Trauma is a way of saying there's something in the nervous system that didn't resolve, you know? I had the impulse to fight back and I never was quite able to. I had the impulse to run and I never was quite able to. And so then the impulse keeps coming back again and again. So this is how I understand distraction. It's not your fault. What it is, is the, the mind, the attention, not, well, let's, let's be more specific than the mind, the faculty of attention turning toward the most intense information in the field. And often that's going to be, that's going to be a story, right? A negative story is more, it has more charge to it, more emotional charge to it than the breath or the body often. And so here comes meditation and it says, pay attention to this relatively boring thing, breathing in, breathing out, you know, the sensation of my butt on the seat, boring. Oh my God, the sins of the past and the horrors of the present, way more interesting. And so I try to be focused. I bring my attention back to the breath and it goes away again. And I bring it back and it goes away again, right? Uh, what we are being asked to do is to train the mind, to train the attention to be uh, stable when we want it to be stable and to observe without losing its center when we want to observe. And I think about this a bit like uh, music. I trained as a classical musician and then a jazz musician and then an experimental musician for 30 years. And one of the things that training in music does is it demystifies music, right? And so I want to talk about training attention as a way of demystifying the mind um, and becoming free from the, uh, the, the way that attention unconsciously is trying to uh, you know, is, is reacting to stimuli in a way that doesn't let me rest. Think about movie music. Think about like soundtracks to films. Very often the soundtrack to a film is, um, is subliminal or not so subliminal emotional manipulation, right? Think about the moment in a romantic uh, film where the romantic couple is doing something, they're talking, they're going somewhere, something's happening, the conversation is slowly going toward more intimacy. And there's always gonna be a place, a moment, so often, there's a moment that happens in, in romantic conversations, right? Where the energy starts to turn toward a different kind of connection, right? They start to notice something in each other. The conversation becomes a little more serious or a little more flirty or something's happening, right? Whatever the flavor movie it is. The music starts right there and it swells up, and it starts to tell you what to feel. This is the part you should start to get like teary about. Look, they're getting together, it's happening, it's finally happening, you know? And the music tells you how to feel that, right? Go back to one of those scenes and watch it, um, even with the subtitles on, but the, but the sound off. It's not hardly as moving, right? It's kind of flat. Without the sound, it's kind of just like lights on the screen. You don't really enter into it in the same way, right? Watch a Marvel movie with the sound off. It's almost absurd, right? You see these people like exploding through the air and things flying up and people turning into things and flashes of light. And it's all kind of dull and flat until you turn the music on and it's like, you know, bum, 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 you know? And, um, and the music is doing some very particular things on purpose, right? It's going slightly faster than your heartbeat, which speeds you up, right? Or it's going slightly slower than your heartbeat, so it kind of calms you down. Um, it's using certain kinds of harmonies that we have been trained through a thousand years of European-based music to associate with certain things, right? 
um, diminished chords with suspense, suspended chords. I could play you at the piano, you know, um, a suspended, uh, you know, subdominant chord, and you would feel like you're in, half of you would feel like you're in church, and you would expect where we're going. You expect the amen after that chord because you've heard it a thousand times, right? So, so music is beautiful, but it's also useful. In other words, it does something. It's not just beautiful without content. It's beautiful with a purpose. And that purpose is feeling. So that's not bad, right? We love music um, for the feelings that it creates. Um, but it's powerful and it can manipulate you. So here's your thoughts. Your thoughts are spinning around and they're responding to the world around you. There's a little discomfort, you know, oh, there's a kind of an ache in my hip. And the thought comes in, you know, um, like, oh, like I've actually had the thought, a tiny twinge in my hip. And the whole story starts like, oh no, my hips are going. I won't really be able to meditate. I won't get much further in my practice. I won't be a good meditation teacher. I won't be able to play soccer with my kid. I, you know, I, it, it's all going downhill. My career, my family life, my sex life, it's all going, you know? And then I'm like, wow, you know, that's intense, man. Like if I actually turn to the sensation, which is what our practice tells us to do, it's just a tiny little twinge. And I know from experience, that it's just what it feels like if I sit still for an hour. And as soon as I get up, it goes away. Eh, all right. And yeah, yeah, I'm getting older. It doesn't always go away as fast. And some of us, it doesn't go away at all. And it's like that. That's the body, right? But, the, but we spin exactly, the, um, you know, the chat said it. We really spin the narrative. Now, the thing about spinning the narrative is we volitionally, on purpose, do not spin the narrative. That's one of the main points I want you to get. The narrative is not on purpose. You're not thinking. For the Buddha, thinking is a sense door. So just like you're hearing the music from the movie, thinking is you're hearing an interpretation of material conditions. And that interpretation is, is intensifying the emotion present. So, you know, I see somebody walking down the street I've been conditioned to fear a person of that, you know, certain costume or certain kind of walk or gait or race or age, you know, or, you know, economic bearing, any of that. There's, there's a feeling, but then the story comes in and the story tells me what to feel and what to fear. And so the training then in directing attention is a little bit like learning enough about music to not be duped. It's actually kind of a deprogramming or a de-hypnotizing training. I know enough about music right now to know what's happening when I hear that stuff, right? And I actually make music and I'd be like, yeah, I can, I can make that sound. I can make a creepy sound on the piano or a romantic sound. And part of doing that is um, that it, it results in stripping away some of the power, some of the hypnosis of the thing. The Buddhist word for this, one of the Buddhist words for this is disenchantment. Buddhist practice disenchants us. And, and you might be like, but I like the enchantment, right? I like the, I like the eros and the drama and the beauty of the world. And of course you do, right? That's why it works. That's why it works. And it's okay. Right? Like there's beautiful things in the world. Eros is beautiful. Music is beautiful. Um, but manipulation gives rise to suffering. And beauty is enrolled in the service of manipulation. And so who's doing this manipulating in my own mind, right? It's not the evil composers who want me to, you know, get excited about Iron Man beating up the bad guys, right? And they're not evil. You know, I like a good Marvel movie as much as the next person. Um, Wakanda forever, but um, but but it's it's still manipulative. So in my own mind, what is what's happening then? And I think this this ties back to our conversation, the place I started about the nervous system and trauma. I think what the mind is um, doing 
is it's manipulating me to with a purpose, right? To try to get me to feel a certain thing. And the feeling is trying to resolve an old wound. I'm trying to figure out how to be well with the past by becoming powerful or becoming or grieving or something. I'm trying to resolve something. And so our training in stabilizing attention recognizes that those stories, uh, that spinning the story doesn't actually resolve suffering. That's really at the heart of the Buddha's message. Spinning the story doesn't resolve the suffering. We have to come into the body. We have to come into stillness. And so when we train in not thinking, or slowing down the thinking, or finding pauses between the thinking. But I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to dull the message. There's a strong training in really learning to stop, to just stop the obsessive uh, flood of thought. How do you do it? Right. How do we do it? Uh, there has to be an understanding of what thought is but also of falling in love, I think, with silence and stillness. So it's not just a kind of like, oh, you know, mechanically come back to the breath, like, oh, I'm just, I'm just, it wanders, I come back, it wanders, I come back. Um, attention is meant to be under our volitional control. And, and for some of us, we've absorbed a lot of very non-dual and Zen teachings that and, and libertarian America anyway, and liberal America both, don't really like control. And so the idea that like we're trying to control the mind, a lot of us will be like, ah, oh, that doesn't sound right. Um, but I'm not backing down on it. Attention is meant to be directed on purpose in the service of healing and freedom. And so then we have to learn actually to stick the attention to silence and keep it there really fall in love with the silence right and and silence and stillness in the buddha's meditations are meant to be pleasurable the buddha says this is pleasurable this is blissful this is peaceful and and this is not just the peace of liberation after it comes this is the peace of meditation and so then our practice is to understand how manipulative the thinking mind is and to do something that's very difficult to do, which is to turn away from that intensity, the intensity of the story that wants us to chew and chew and chew on all the old grievances. And in meditation, in the special ritual, sacred space of meditation, to bring the attention to stillness and just be willing, and actually more than willing, to be devoted to stopping. To stopping. That's the cessation, that's the third noble truth, the stopping of this process of spinning out. And then meditation uh, in, involves the training then, that's the beginning, the stopping, and then stretching out that stopping until we learn a different state, a different way to be, where we are right here with all of the conditions, all of the fluctuating beauty and horror of the world. And we are not adding intensity and, and, and force to it by running around in story about it. You know, so uh, holding our ground. And there's forms where we hold our ground with real stillness. That's the concentration forms. And there's forms where we hold our ground in steady awareness and thoughts like sounds and sights come and go, right? That's the awareness kind of practice. They're both, they both include holding steady. They just hold a different thing steady. Um, the awareness practice is harder, right? Because it's, it's a more di diffuse object. Learning to really connect with silence or stillness is, uh, is a profound relearning of intimacy with the world. And I think it's the healing that the path points toward. And it becomes a profound intervention in our life in the world. 
as we have to learn how to engage with all the horrors of the world with a clear heart, with a clearer heart uh, than the one, uh, you know, the hypnotists and the soundtrack writers uh, want us to uh, uh, habituate. So may our hearts be clear, may our minds find stillness, uh, may we find the clarity to, uh, to train in, in settledness and experience the joys uh, of peace in meditation and beyond uh, throughout our whole life. So we'll pause there, and it's really a pleasure to reflect on some of this with you. Thank you for listening. We have a few minutes for questions and reflections here. Um, uh, you can drop questions into the chat, and I'll, and I'll try to see them in the flow, or you can raise your electronic hands. And I'll, uh, yeah, Rick, and go ahead and unmute, and you can speak. So thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, much appreciated. Um, yeah, so I put in the chat, I'm a pretty bad meditator. I just don't meditate every day. Uh, I'd like to get to a point where I can. But when I do meditate, uh, I definitely do from time to time experience a kind of stillness and a settledness and a silence. And I'm wondering if it's okay to kind of marinate in those feelings while at the same time sort of maintaining the thread of attention with the inflow, for example, the inflow and outflow of the breath. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's not only okay, it's, it's the direction to go. Yeah. When the Buddha describes the path toward really immers immersing in meditation, he says it's like kneading water into a ball of dough so that it sticks together, it holds together completely and is fully saturated and doesn't drip. That's mm -hmm. the image. Um, it's a ball of soap powder for a bath for whatever reason. That was yeah. the image that he had. And the idea is that you are using concentration and breath to, to massage the pleasure of, of stillness into your whole body. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, what, that's what marinating makes me think of. Yeah. Find that, that stillness, hold on to it. Dare I say, cling to it, right? Direct sure. your attention at the stillness, breathe with stillness. Stillness, by which I mean the mind, right? Absence of story. Listen to the silence breathe that silence into the whole body and then find whatever's pleasurable about that right um, and it's really it's pleasure the buddha discovered his path by remembering pleasure yeah and so you spread the pleasure of stillness through the whole body all right can i ask him one other question go for it all right um so uh, I can't remember the doctor's name, uh, uh, but something um, wrote a book about uh, the body. Um, uh, can, Keeps can, the score? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Be Bessel van der Kolk. Okay, great. Yeah, so um, I, I really appreciate your comments about the past, and I can't seem to let go of the past and I'm trying to correct, you know, mistakes that I made in the past and sure. um, can't do it. Um, it sure. you know, wasn't heroic for any number of times in, in the past. And, and I'm just wondering, so I appreciate uh, what I'm hearing is that you're probably not going to be able to do that by spinning all sorts of, you know, narrative, you know, uh, contrary, contradictory uh, stories that uh, sort of, um, you know, or contrary or to those narratives. Yeah. But that really the practice yeah. is is simply finding that stillness. But partly, I'm just yeah. partly. But yeah, the question is how do we let go, right? Yeah. Um I think of letting you can't let go on purpose. Right? Um letting go is uh the result of maturity. And so, so the example that I'll often give is think about something you were obsessed about as a teenager, mm -hmm. right? A band, a person, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. I was obsessed about 
The Lord of the Rings and Doctor Who and, you know, uh, a few people whose names I won't include, you know, attractive sure. people, things like that. Mm. Um, uh, and now, you know, s some of those things are still beautiful. I still appreciate the music of Depeche Mode, mm -hmm. but I'm not attached to it. You know, I don't care whether I hear it or not on a given day. Um, I've let it go. I didn't on purpose let it go. There wasn't a moment when I said, stop obsessing about Depeche Mode, right? I just lived my life and I heard a lot of music and it, and it gradually became unspecial, mm -hmm. right? My first, uh, my first lover, my first five lovers, you know, bless them, bless all of you, right? Mm -hmm. Gradually became not my lovers and then gradually became lovers I no longer obsess about, right? I let go. I didn't let go on purpose. I didn't say, N today I will stop obsessing about this particular sexy person who was marvelous in 1992. You know, bless you. Uh, mm -hmm. You were. And um, uh, letting go is a way of, of saying, oh, I can see that that particular obsession no longer has a grip on my heart. Mm -hmm. And the training in meditation is not just you know, to still the mind. That's just, that's the concentration part. Mm -hmm. Meditation is a training uh, to learn how to delight in what is always available right here. Mm -hmm. And the stronger that delight, you know, really the eros of the present moment, uh, the stronger that becomes, mm -hmm. the easier it will be to, to notice that you're no longer obsessed about the thing that you were obsessed about in 1992 or whenever, you know. Um, letting go is a way of, of, of becoming an elder, becoming a true wise elder, you know, like a grandmother who sees the kids like tumbling around in the yard and they scrape their knees and they get into fights and they fall in love with each other and they do all the things and the grandmother just sits on the porch and sees it all because she's been there, you know, and, and has wisdom, right? Uh, she's not troubled. Uh, letting go is, is, is close to equanimity. Yeah. And you can't, you can't pretend it, you can't fake it. Mm -hmm. um, but our path here is to grow up very deeply, more deeply than any of us or any of most of our elders have done, you know. Amen. The Dharma elders, I think, are the most mature people around. And that's not just the Buddhist ones, but the, the real wise elders in any tradition. Um, you know, so I think that's what we're going for here. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so Thank much. You. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Sean, this is usually the time that we end. So I'm I just letting you know that, but you're in good. charge. Thank you. It, hey, everybody, it's time to end. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take, uh, uh, so, so, so bounce off as you need. I want to, before we, I'll do the formal close and say, thank you for your support of this group and your dana, your generous offerings that make sanghas like this, uh, possible and continue to be available to all. Come and find me and my teachings anytime you like. My website is on that website and, um, and you can find it. Uh, my regular group is on Tuesday nights. And, um, and may our practice be for the benefit of all. May all beings be safe from harm. May all the wars end, inner and outer. And may all beings find the profound peace of heart and mind that is uh, the heartwood of the holy life. So blessings in your practice. Thanks for being here. Thanks for uh, being a warm uh, circle to teach in tonight.